My grandmother, who was born in 1903, used to think that German quality is the worst quality in the world. German products were the worst in her, in her lifetime. I researched that further and found that actually in her time it was true. And the British were aware of it, so they passed what is called the law of provenance, that basically said that every product should, have a, should state where it comes from. So made in Germany meant it was bad. And the Germans were aware of it, so they came up with the idea of the circle of excellence, which is because a circle can only be perfect if it's round. If it's oval, if it's, it's dented, it's oval. If it's got a dent, you can see it. And that's why the old German logos are circular. Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Hercks, Bayer, and all of those kinds of things, because they were fixing what it is. Today, we look back, we think German quality is the best in the world. Dito, the Koreans with LG and Samsung. And I like to believe that we can ignite Africa into success. And also, when people die, people will like to believe, I'd like people, when I die, I'd like people to know that Africa produces the best quality in the world. I was born 50, uh, 50 kilometers east of Johannesburg in a place called Dachafondein. <laughs> so when I started working, I found white people buying Dacha for five rand. I said, you buy Dacha for five rand? So much money? <laughs> because that's 50 kilometers east of Johannesburg in a place called Springs, and this is a suburb of Dachafondein. Then during the forced removals, the forced removals came and we were supposed to were moved out of the place. And the picture that you see there that I went back, I went back to Painville to take pictures is of the houses that we demolished. So people would just leave a mark to remember where their house used to be. Uh, my mother's house, my mother refused to move. So the police came with the guys who used to demolish, threw the furniture out and demolished the house. And somebody ran to her while she was at work as a nurse to say, hey, your house has been demolished. My grandmother, fortunately, had just taken us about a, a week or two ago because she was saying that this was going to come. So people would go back and make a mark there to remember the place where they were born for, you, brother, for your brothers and sisters and also to tell them the stories that we have from there. It was a tough place, but also we had good times there. The picture that you see there at the top is of the Patco bus, bus stop where we used to get off when we went to school. And there's a road there that you can see and we used to buy ourselves a quarter loaf of bread, open it up, put Erica butter, and then put hot chips, and then close it in nice and melt, and then you put it on the road for the bus to drive on there so it's nice and flat. It's a lovely sandwich. But there was a problem because the two wheels at the back, sometimes the bread would go in there, and off it's gone. So what do you do? You sit on it. And you know in Africa we say mpeng mpeng wala pizza. Give me, give me leads to poverty. We weren't allowed to beg. So if somebody is a freeloader comes and asks for, a, for, you, for you to break him a piece, what do you do when you're sitting on your bread? You fart on it. <laughs> Boop. They won't be asking for that piece of bread and you can eat it. I mean, it's called recycling, isn't it? We didn't have toilets. So the houses did not have toilets or bathrooms or ablutions as we call it. Every two streets had to share a toilet, and these were the washing stands. The pictures that you see at the top there is the washing stand where we, people used to do their washing. Our street was on 4th Street, uh, was where the toilets used to be, so people called it Kakstrat, you know. <laughs> so my brother used to sit there at the porch, and people used to show, you know, the Range Rover status at the time was a toilet paper, because all of the rest of us used not tissue paper, but newspapers. So if you use the newspaper, so the school principal used to walk around with the toilet paper and walk past our house and my brother would be sitting there and say, hello, Tishar, hello, Tishar, good job, how are you? We are happy, where are you going? We are kaka, are you going to take a dump? <laughs> and my mother would be saying, Freddy, quiet, Freddy, you can't be saying that, quiet. <laughs> and then the school principal realized that, no, the best thing then to do is to put it in his pocket. So he'd walk and put it in his pocket and off he goes. And he walks past, my brother goes again, Hello, Tishar, Bujan, we are happy, we are kaka, leave the paper, where's the paper? <laughs> the toilet, ladies and gentlemen, has been a big part of the struggle. So, when they were trying to move us off Painville, and people were saying, No, we're not going, I remember the superintendent, the white superintendent, coming up and saying at a mass meeting, Ladies and gentlemen, the good thing about Guatemala is that the toilet is inside. And he said, 
So Mrs. Mkhaku got up there and said, Bas, are you saying, Uti wongu mtoz vilanga pande, Oze ulus oze iskop, Uzongena la enzim, Anyel enzim. So are you saying that everybody who's eating anything and everything is going to come into my house and take a dump in my house? How's that going to smell? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I must admit that to this day, I'm an outside man. I still prefer my toilet outside. But this was opportunity. The one thing that happened was there were certain brands that grew as an ad man. It's very interesting to see the, the place and the environment that makes certain brands grow. There was no hot water up there in Painville. So Omo became the market leader. And in all their advertising, they used to say, the tagline used to say, Nase Manzina Bandai, even in cold water, because there, there was no hot water. And if you've taken your whole washing to go and do, then you realize, oh my goodness, I left the, the soap behind. What do you do? Yes, Bandai. Isa, let it into your up and sunlight the green soap. Their tagline was, Uma Bizwa Sabele is sunlight. The one when he's called will come running. Now, if we want to build brands, because the only way we can build Africa, or at least the one perspective of building brands, is we need to understand our market and the things that matter to our market. Those are the things that will make us help, that will help us build brands when we find the need for those kinds of things. I wanted to be a train driver, ladies and gentlemen. All I wanted to do was to be a train driver. I used to live in, live in Springs and my aunt used to live in Dube. I used to catch the train from Dube all the way to Naledi. I saw in Tazana Station today, I was ecstatic. But I could not become a train driver at the time because black people weren't allowed to be train drivers. And um, so I ended up going to university. I, I went to matric, and I was told at matric that, no, sorry, blacks don't because of the Job, Job Reservations Act. I have kept here a ticket that I bought in 1994, in April. Little did I know at the time that this would be the last time I'm declared a third-class citizen in my own country. If you look carefully at the ticket, you can see that third class, adult, 20 rand 50 cash, 3004, 1994, it expired, 19, and we voted on the 27th of April, 1994. So this is the last ticket that said that I am not a free citizen. I'm not a free man. I'm a third class citizen in our country. And you have the great opportunity that you don't have that. You didn't experience that. So don't let what you see up there hold you back. Don't let the experiences that I've experienced hold you back. Because I have lived to see a system that I thought it would never die. I've lived to see it die. And therefore, I do believe and firmly believe that I will see a time where Africa becomes the greatest continent on Earth. We can build from the ruins. We've seen pictures of students, of black kids learning out in the tree, but you haven't seen, if you Google on the internet, you will find children, German children, learning out in the open after the war. We sit under the tree because it's, it's hot. They used to sit out in the snow. So black people, you do not have the monopoly on suffering. Don't ever, ever lie to yourself or be lied to. But most importantly, don't ever lie to yourself. You don't have a monopoly on suffering. Others have, su have suffered and you will not be better by always telling others how they've oppressed us. There's a great book that you should all read, The Miseducation of the Negro, about we are the people who make the chains that enslave us. We can build from the ruins. In the rural areas, I took these pictures, one in Tata, one in KZN, and hopefully one day they will look like Johannesburg. It's your time. The Economist and Time magazine never agree on anything, except that it's Africa's time, Africa rising. When Barack Obama came here, he saw that too. So if you don't succeed, unlike me, all of you young people have no white men to, do, to, to, to blame. I ran my first ad that I ever made was targeted black people. Well, the first one, uh, said it was actually about the corporate ladder falling in 1998. It was a picture of a black woman at the bottom, a black man all naked. In the middle, it was a white woman, and right at the top, it was a white man. All looking at behind, and it said, it's time the corporate ladder fell. And my second ad was, who are you going to blame next time? Africa's rising. We must take care of that opportunity. 
I always say self-economic empowerment is a new black economic empowerment. I traveled around, and here are all these kids. Looking, I mean, we, we were flying on a, on, a, on a balloon, and it landed, and there were dogs barking, and everybody in the rural area. Who are they going to do a BE deal with? I lived in a place where if you see a white man, you go, oh, wow. How, what, what, what broke? <laughs> did your car break down? How did you get here? Because there are no white people. There's only one white person there. We are the majority here. And we should have the self-confidence to live as such. Not have to try and explain ourselves to white people. If they don't understand, you go ahead. We're so obsessed with white people that we forget about ourselves. Who wakes up in the morning and say, by the way, I'm black? <laughs> by the way, let's wake up and live our lives. Because in African languages, we, so, we don't say mdomnyama, umumuntu. You're a human being, you're umutu. And that's where it ends. Don't, be, don't define ourselves, let's not define ourselves through the negative of others who've decided that they were white and therefore we look like coal, because we don't. You know, we always go through really difficult times in South Africa, like it's happening right now. The picture I took there, I took in a place called um, Satan's Neck, Gwasatane. You can hardly see any further. You cannot see beyond what your lights show you, but you can make the whole trip that way. So we don't have to know the future, how the future is going to look like. As far as lambs can see, we can make it that way. We can go through our lives and make a great continent. But we can only do that if we understand what happens in our communities. So when you travel around South Africa, you see a board that says 70 kilometers you always, or uh, 60 kilometers, you always think you're going to do that in half an hour. But sometimes do that in two hours. I took this picture, picture in a place called Bazia, not very far from Kunu. So, and I was a retailer there. And somebody decided to introduce Rika. You have to Rika your, your SIM card. Rika, you need to have water and lights bill, a street address, and all of that kind of thing. There's a road on that picture there, if you can see it. I'd like to know probably, if, can anybody guess what the name of the road is? People don't get water light, and, and, and lights bill because they won't go and fetch the water from the river. So I saw at the stroke, with a stroke of a pen, millions of people being shut out of communications. I remember this old man coming to buy a SIM card and Belinda saying to, uh, to the old man, what is that document? What is that, my child? He said, I want to forget in the upper. A letter that says, when did you arrive here? Because fika in Nguni means to arrive. Because these things, we think about them in Pretoria, in the cities, and we've shut out lots of people out of the communication. I went to a place where they call the high reliability organizations, the Jobik Zoo, and tried to find out why don't they have accidents? Why don't lions kill people off there? Simple. They train people in the mother tongue. I'm saying teach maths and science in the mother tongue, like the Germans, like the Afrikaners. It's a shame that 20 years into our democracy, we don't have textbooks that teach maths and science, that we still don't have medical degrees offered in, the, in African languages, like the African kids learn, because we don't believe in ourselves. We're so obsessed trying to be white, and we speak everything in trying to be like white people, and to fit in their, situ in, in, in their circumstance, yet in places where life, matters of life and death are everyday issues, we speak in our mother tongues, and we should have that in our languages as well. And why we should do that? If we want to change things, we must believe in ourselves. And belief is not enough, because you can believe everything you want in the toilet, but you must go out and do it. <laughs> and when you do it, you've got to package it well, because you have the confidence in what you believe in. Ladies and gentlemen, I took this picture of a black woman surfing, out in the Atlantic Ocean with a tanker there behind, it, behind you. Now, what you probably don't know is that your heart, before you, if you die at age of 70, you're going to pump enough blood to fill out a whole oil tanker. So the magic we need to change the world is right inside us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.